Like any decent hotel, there are wake-up calls. Attentive staff. Did you not hear what I said, yes or no? No, I didn't say OK, your hands on right here. And vacancies guaranteed any day or night. So that sends a message. The sheriff will make room no matter what. Welcome to Arizona's Tent City Jail, home to Sheriff Joe Arpaio's unconventional detention, where more is spent on feeding police dogs than the inmates. This is America's toughest jail. No cigarettes, no porn, no coffee, but everyone gets to wear pink. Why pink? Because they hate pink. Why would you give them a color they like? Also, we have pink handcuffs. So everything's pink. And daily workouts are complimentary. March time, march! Uh, uh. On the sheriff's chain gang. In the sweltering Arizona heat, Sheriff Arpaio wants his guests to be so happy to leave, they'll never return. It's 3 p.m. in Phoenix, Arizona. New inmates are entering the Maricopa County Jail System, one of the largest and toughest prisons in America. 10,000 inmates are packed into six separate jails spread out across the city, and more arrive every day. In Phoenix, there are more inmates than jail cells. To deal with the overflow, Sheriff Joe Arpaio created Tent City, I will always have room. I will go to my grave. Before I let these guys out early, I'll put more tents up from here to Mexico if I have to. So that sends a message. The sheriff will make room no matter what. In the desert near downtown Phoenix, Tent City houses 2,000 inmates in canvas tents. Unlike the county's other jails, where offenders spend most of their time locked in cramped cells, inmates here get plenty of time outdoors. But that's where the advantages end. Temperatures inside the tents can reach 45 degrees Celsius in summer. To save money, extras like sugar, salt, pepper, and coffee are banned. Tobacco and porn are also strictly forbidden. And with no bars to control a volatile mix of inmates, officers maintain order with military-like discipline and force. All right, gentlemen, listen up. This is a strict disciplinary environment. There is no arguing. There is no disrespect toward staff members when you're here. You will address everybody here as ma'am, sir, or officer. Does everybody understand? Yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes sir. All right. In this tense environment, hostility between prisoners and guards simmers and sometimes boils over. So then what's your situation here? I just want to walk on the fence, man. Because you're getting searched as part of being in jail. In the last decade, scores of inmates and guards in the local county jails have been injured in violent clashes. Four inmates have died, raising concerns in Phoenix and the rest of America. Tent City inmates have been convicted of crimes ranging from drug possession to assault. They usually serve a maximum sentence of one year if they stay out of trouble. But if they get out of line, they could end up in lockdown at an indoor jail or serving a much longer sentence in state prison. It's 19-year-old Ryan Merlina's first day here. All right, gentlemen, listen up. When Officer Dewar calls your name, grab your property and step forward. Merlina. I don't know what I would really compare it to. There's no comparison. It's pretty, pretty crappy here. I think, I think this, would be, this is a pretty hard time right here. He's been convicted of forgery, burglary, and most recently, possession of methamphetamine. A meth user since he was 12, Ryan Molina has spent his teen years in and out of juvenile detention. This is his first time in the adult system. In exchange for pleading guilty, the court offered Ryan a deal. If he behaves himself, he'll serve just six months at Tent City. But if he messes up, he'll get 12 years in state prison. You were not expecting this when you came to jail, huh? No.
this is pretty much my last chance. If I do mess up in here or on the outside, I'm looking at 12 years off the bat. But surviving a tent city is going to be harder than anything he's ever done. The 19-year-old is surrounded by a range of criminals, from shoplifters to convicted killers. And living conditions are harsh. He gets a bedroll, a sheet, and a bunk in a tent with 21 other prisoners. Welcome to the tent, bro. His main motivation to behave and get out of jail is to see his son, who was born while he awaited sentencing. I think about my child a lot. Um, I think about what's going to happen if I don't change my ways. I grew up without a father, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't want that to happen to him. Recently, Ryan's mother and girlfriend cut ties with him because of his drug use. At Tent City, he's also on his own. Veteran jailer Sergeant Mendoza has worked for a decade in Phoenix jails, including two years at Tent City. Like his fellow officers, he enforces zero tolerance for rule breakers. Sir, you need to get your shirt on before you step out of your tent. Mendoza is on the front line in the battle against the illegal trade in contraband. But he faces a constant challenge to his authority, the racial groups that dominate Tent City. Unfortunately, everything out here is organized by race. When a new inmate comes into our system, they'll be approached by someone from their race who will explain to them what the rules and expectations are out here. The number one rule is to stick to your own ethnic group. Each group has its own seating area and name. African Americans are called kinfolk. Mexicans, paisas. Mexican Americans, chicanos. Native Americans, chiefs. And the whites are called the woods. The gang leaders claim they provide protection, but officers say their purpose is to control inmates and contraband. Oftentimes, the heads of the races are involved in some of the criminal activity and the contraband smuggling that goes on out here. Unfortunately, as soon as we remove a head from the yard, they're replaced by somebody else right away. So we're constantly trying to find out who they are. They're constantly trying to hide their identity from us, and it's a game that just goes on and on and on forever. For new inmates like Ryan Molina, there may be safety in numbers. But sometimes it's not rival groups fresh faces have to worry about. It's their own. For inmates who break the rules of their race, punishment is swift and painful. For minor infractions like a verbal insult, a chin check, or punch in the jaw. For a major offense, like not paying back a debt, a smashing, a vicious beating by three or more inmates. The influence of racial gangs threatens prison officers' grip on control. They are criminals, and you can't turn your back on them. Right now, when you look out on this yard, everything is quiet but that could change at a moment's notice. We have had some major disturbances out here in the past. We've actually had an inmate take control of the yard. In 1996, Tent City exploded into violence when all of the racial groups rioted after an officer allegedly shot pepper spray in the face of an inmate. The situation quickly spiraled out of control. Inmates took eight guards hostage and burned two tents to the ground. It took law enforcement three hours to regain control of the jail. To deal with rioting inmates, the jail has a heavily armed unit called the Special Response Team, or SRT. Sergeant Irby is in charge of one of four SRT squads that make daily raids throughout the jail system. We're called whenever there's a, a situation in the facility that, that has gotten out of hand. Be it from uh, multiple inmate fights, we've responded to 20, 30 inmates fighting in a pod. Irby's team of seven officers responds to everything from brawls to assaults on jail staff. My job is care, custody, and control. And, that, and heavy on the control end of it now that I'm a member of SRT. And that's all we intend to do is to control situation. If newcomer Ryan Molina gets involved in illegal activity, the special response team will strike. Trouble may find him whether he wants it or not. At the end of his first day, Ryan Molina returns to his tent. The woods are waiting for him. 
They're ready to officially claim him as a member of their group. This is America's toughest jail. Exactly. He meets the white gang leader called The Head and the rule enforcer called The Torpedo. The identities of the highest ranking members must be kept a secret from detention officers. Being the head of a racial group is against jail rules. You smart off to any of the DOs, your tent's gonna get tossed, your monkeys are gonna get mad at you over it. The DOs have ways of um, turning us against each other if we mess up, that's their way of punishing us. I mess mean, up. they'll make you look like a bad guy and get, our, get your tent tossed on you, then it's gonna make everybody in your tent mad at you. So just don't do anything to disrespect any of your fellow inmates in your tent. Ryan is learning the unwritten rules at Tent City. If he disregards them, his group can turn on him in an instant. You're not a kid, you're an adult. You know what to do, what not to do. You got a nice haircut too, I like that. <laughs> Ryan must master two conflicting sets of rules, those of his fellow inmates and those of the jail. If he can't maintain this dangerous balancing act, the consequences could be devastating. It's 5 a.m. at Tent City in Phoenix, Arizona. Power's crew, ride right shine. Get to the east gate. An officer wakes up first-time offender Ryan Molina and hustles him out of the tent. Oh, it's all work. All inmates at Tent City have jobs, and Ryan starts his today. Who? 2113. You're going with that gentleman. He'll be serving food to inmates at the nearby Towers Jail, just across the parking area from Tent City. It's a job with challenges and temptations that could land him in serious trouble. From what I heard, a lot of the inmates in here are going to want extra food, and uh, consequences for me getting extra food, I'll be going to the hole, so uh, I can't do that. Unlike inmates at Tent City, who have all been convicted, 70% of these men are still awaiting trial. But Towers Jail offers even less freedom than Tent City. On chow duty, Molina will come face to face with aggressive inmates who spend 23 hours a day locked in small cells. Their charges range from driving without a license to assault with a deadly weapon. They'll try to threaten and bribe him for more food. For a former meth addict and troublemaker, avoiding danger and opportunities could be tough. To keep costs down, the jail feeds these inmates only two meals a day of surplus food. The sheriff's office publicizes the fact that it spends just 40 cents per inmate per day on food compared to $1.40 for police dogs. As Ryan gets ready to deliver the budget food, one of his co-workers prepares him for what's about to come. They get one meal, one bag, that's it. They'll ask you, they'll beg you, they'll cry, and they'll, they'll hide their milk, saying they didn't get a milk. Yeah. Ryan steals himself. To keep things in order, inmates are ordered to line up in single file. A detention officer carefully checks each prisoner's ID to make sure they only get one bag of food. Hey, hey where you at? Huh? Under the officer's watchful eye, things go smoothly at first. But as soon as his back is turned, one inmate tries it on. Hey, give me an extra limo bag. Can't do it, man. Can't do it, dog. Ryan passes his first test, and things are calm for the moment. But just around the corner, Sergeant Irby and the special response team prepare for a surprise raid. Yes, Don't provoke anybody. It's part of a program of random searches to keep control throughout the county jails. They're on a constant lookout for weapons and contraband that fuel inmate violence over black market tobacco and drugs. Watch your use of force. Okay. 
Sergeant Irby gives the signal. Go. And the team moves in. An officer fires a thunder shot from his 12-gauge shotgun. It's a blank round, but it delivers a deafening boom and flash of light that momentarily stuns the inmates into submission. SRT uses the element of surprise for the simple reason that we need to catch them off guard. We use that boar thunder to get their attention. Everybody went to the floor and we control the situation. Many inmates think such force is excessive, but to Sergeant Irby and his officers, prisoners are there to be controlled. Put your hands on your head. There's no talking. SRT is zero tolerance. We're not going to put up with a bunch of talk and a bunch of moving around. We control the situation. And if we can't control the situation, then we'll shut it down. We control it. You move when I tell you to move. You talk to me when I want you to talk to me. You understand what I'm saying? Separate your feet. With the inmates stripped down and under control, the team fans out to search each inmate and each cell for any banned items. We have a flyer. They're hunting for tobacco or drugs and the equipment needed to smoke them. We found where they had actually had uh, little glass pipes stuck and stuff like this. First glance, it's straight see-through. You don't even notice it. So sometimes it's good to put it up to the light. Officer Spaulding has served with Sergeant Irby for a year and a half. One coming down. Fourteen! Put your hands on your head. Keep your pants on. I don't want to see anything. Take your shirt off. She knows that keeping nearly 100 inmates in line is a dangerous business and she takes her responsibility seriously. You know, zero tolerance. Sergeant Irby tells us zero tolerance, and that's exactly what we do. Every corner and every object in the cell needs to be carefully checked. Even seemingly innocent items like plastic bottles can become dangerous weapons in the wrong hands. So sometimes what they like to do is they take the cleaner and douse an officer with it, especially if it's bleach. So anything that is not in its original container is going to be considered contraband. Inmates are constantly finding new ways to make weapons. But the, what they'll do is they'll take that razor blade and they'll place it in between, and then they'll tighten us up with rubber bands, and they'll use it as a shank, slice somebody open with it when they, when they least expect it. One of the items found today is a bottle of homemade alcohol, or hooch, which inmates make out of fermented fruit, bread, and smuggled in sugar. Uh, inmates take uh, anything they can that's sweet and put it with bread and then through the stages of fruit they, it ferments and then it turns into an alcohol, they make an alcohol out of it. But uh, the few guys that I know that have ever drank it have told me it'll make you sick if you drink too much of it. For Irby and his squad, the hooch confirms that the contraband trade is still thriving. As long as inmates deal in contraband, there's the potential for violence. And that means the special response team will need to keep the pressure on. Edward Ramirez is used to the raids. This is his fourth stint in county jail for crimes ranging from petty theft to assaulting his estranged wife's boyfriend. Now, he's near the end of a four-month sentence for violating parole. I've been in and out of the system. I've been in here from cases of aggravated assault, uh, theft of means of transportation, uh, forgery, to selling drugs, um, carry, uh, carrying concealed weapons. You know, um, I lived on the streets, and when you live on the streets, there's just a lot of things that you do to survive. Like Ryan Molina, Edward Ramirez started out in Tent City. He got kicked out for being the head of a racial group. Now he's on lockdown at Towers Jail. That means sharing this 8 by 10 foot cell with two other inmates 23 hours a day. Well, this is lockdown. We have uh, three inmates in here. Here's our toilet. And in our same room, we eat. And the three of us also sleep here. It's difficult. You get a lot of mood swings with your cellmates, even though if you guys do get along, because you're just irritated being locked down, cramped in this small little area. The father of four says he had just about given up hope on a future outside of jail. Then, 
he received a letter from his 11-year-old daughter. Hi, Daddy, I miss you so much. I get sad sometimes, but I know that I have to be strong for the babies, so I cry in my room at night. How long do you have to stay in the hole? You will always be in my heart forever and ever. Hope you get out soon. But there's only one way out of lockdown, the chain gang. Inmates on the chain gang work long hours outside in the desert heat, doing jobs like cleaning up roadside rubbish and digging graves. Many inmates can't take the heat and quit. The jail calls it a last chance program. The inmates call it hell. But the ones who can make it for 30 days on the chain gang can earn a transfer out of lockdown at Towers Jail to the open air at Tent City. With just four weeks left on his sentence, Edward Ramirez says his only reason to join is to show he can be a better man. There's just a lot of responsibility that's required being on the chain gang. We gotta be up early, have our beds made. We gotta pick up trash, serve chow to all the other inmates in this, in this facility. But following rules has been hard for him in the past. And if he disobeys orders on the chain gang, it could add years to his sentence. Meanwhile, it's Ryan Molina's second week at Phoenix Jail's Tent City. At just 19 years old, he's in with convicts who are twice his age. Fights break out constantly, mostly over contraband like cigarettes. The tobacco in the yard, it, it creates a problem because now the races are fighting for the right to sell it, the right to move it, and the right to have it. For officers like Sergeant Irby, cracking down on contraband is a daily struggle. At times, only two officers patrol the entire yard of 800 inmates. This means there are plenty of ways for enterprising prisoners to bring contraband into the yard. There are hundreds of inmates out there on the yard, but hundreds go to work. They go to work as trustees working out on the grounds. So whatever they see on the ground are fine, they, they can bring that back. If Ryan Molina plans on being free in six months, he'll need to steer clear of the contraband trade. The strategy is pretty much just to lay low and uh, keep to myself. I mean, there's a few people that I talk to, but um, pretty much not getting dead with anybody and uh, just get through my time as quick as possible. But that won't be easy. He now spends all his time with a white racial group called the Woods. The group provides him with protection, and in the open spaces of Tent City with no place to hide, he needs all the protection he can get. But being accepted by the whites-only Woods gang is a double-edged sword. Several members of the Woods are active contraband dealers, and they have ways of drawing new recruits into the trade. Today, another inmate called Tripod invites Merlina to join in a game of cards. Inmates usually gamble for fun, but sometimes for contraband. If young Ryan ends up in debt, he may have to pay up by performing a risky service for other inmates, like smuggling black market goods. What starts as a friendly game turns tense when the newcomer starts losing. I think you switched the books up, though, dog. Because there was that book right there. It was that book right there, though, dog. I don't know. How am I supposed to know which one's first? How am I supposed to know? Because that's the whole thing. Nobody says spades is a clean game. When there's items on the table, I'm all about winning. But Ryan doesn't realize that Tripod is being closely watched by detention officers. The word on the yard is that Tripod is a major player in the illegal tobacco trade. What tent you live in, sir? Yeah, so you're in the wrong yard, weren't you? Yes, sir. Okay, so you're in the wrong yards. Why don't you go ahead and jump up on the fence over there? Look <laughs> at Tripod. What's up, Tripod? What'd you do, Tripod? <laughs> See what else you got on him. Officers search him at every opportunity. Anything else? No, you sir. Know about? No, sir. What's that? Put that out of your pocket. Let me see it. It's been smoking again. Let me see your hands. They check his fingernails for nicotine stains. No smoke on my yard, sir. It's a good way to go away. If Ryan gets lured into illegal activity under the terms of his court deal, his short jail term could turn into 12 years in prison. But at Tenth City, it's hard to avoid trouble. Edward Ramirez thinks he's found a way. The sheriff's chain gang. 
Like all county inmates, he prepares for his day by putting on the special jail issue pink. According to Sheriff Arpaio, inmates were stealing the standard white undergarments, so he had them all dyed, along with all the sheets, towels, and handcuffs. And there's another reason for his unique choice of color. Why make them wear pink underwear? Why pink? Because they hate pink, at least in this county. Why would you give them a color they like? Also, we have pink handcuffs, so everything's pink. All right, take one step forward. At 5 a.m., Edward Ramirez and 12 other inmates begin the shift. Officers shackle them with ankle chains to limit their movement and chances of escape. March time, march! Uh, 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 right, right, uh. Inmates on the chain gang have to learn four different chants. They're supposed to help them keep in step and build morale. For the next eight hours, they'll work in the searing desert heat. Today, the chain gang is collecting rubbish along a highway near Arizona State University. Officer Parks keeps careful watch. He's armed with a 12-gauge shotgun in case anyone gets out of hand. Clear a sidewalk for me, please. Do not make contact even at the bus stop. Gentlemen, you know what contraband is. Do not pick it up and stay out of the road. Do not get down in the gutter. Stay only in the dirt. Having inmates this close to civilians carries certain risks. There will be no interaction between the inmates and the public. We don't want them giving the inmates stuff to bring back with them, whether it be drugs, tobacco, weapons, anything coming back into the facility. Forward, march! As the head of the chain, it's the responsibility of Edward Ramirez to call out the chants and make sure that everyone marches in step. But six new inmates joined the gang this morning, and it's not going smoothly. We have about uh, six new guys on the chain. They don't know how to march right or turn right yet. A lot of these new guys, they're joking rather than out here working and they don't really, really pay attention to what's going on. They don't really care what's going on out here. Every full step messes up the group's timing, forcing the men to stop and start again. Edward Ramirez is losing patience, but if he takes his frustration out on the other inmates, he'll be taken back to lockdown. March time, march! Left, left. Left, right, right, left. The gang gets left. through today without mishap. It's been harder than Edward expected. If he can get through two more weeks, he'll be eligible for release. But with this young crew, he knows anything could happen. Back in Tent City, the cat and mouse game between inmates and guards over contraband continues. Officer McVaugh has such a knack for sniffing out contraband, they call him the bloodhound. In the open environment of Tent City, tobacco could be anywhere. Today, he is training a rookie, Officer Cox. He takes the newcomer with him on his daily rounds. Suddenly, Bloodhound McVaugh smells smoke coming from one of the tents. He ducks inside and confronts the inmates. Everybody, outside, grab fence. Let's go. Basically, the inmates were uh, smoking in a tent. Uh, they all decided to scatter. Some, you know, they wanted to run another tent. So we're going to start with one tent and continue through until we uh, find what we're looking for. The officers raid the tents. They'll confiscate any contraband they find. This is all stuff that they can't have. Uh, they've taken the soap and, and altered it to make dominoes. So I will end up taking all of these with me. For the inmates, raids are unwelcome intrusions, and they're not happy. This happens every day, we every single day. We'll you could be that. in your tent, you could be in your tent reading the Bible. Your Bible gets tossed out, point <laughs> blank. If I'm going to be on film, I'm going to tell the truth. This is calamity. 
So you're trying to call me a liar? No, I'm not trying to call you a liar. Everybody else out here needs to search until I find them. But Officer McVaugh knows someone's hiding tobacco, and he's determined to find it. They'll tear open the mattress, and they'll hide, you know, they can put a pouch of tobacco in there, lighter. After combing through the first two tents, they find nothing. But Bloodhound McVaugh isn't done yet. A 19-year-old Ryan Molina's tent is next. Why don't you guys mind your own business and sit in your bunks? Now Ryan, Tripod, and the other inmates have to wait while their tent is taken apart and thoroughly searched. At 7.30 in the morning, they tell me to wake up so they could toss all my stuff. Yeah, I do get kind of upset about that, you know what I'm saying? Compared to a traditional jail cell, a tent and the grounds outside offer many unusual hiding places, and the officer they call the Bloodhound knows them all. Illegal tobacco can be hidden under rocks, stashed in tent folds, or wedged behind support poles. The Bloodhound sends his rookie up high to check the top of the tent frame. Check the lights. He finds something. Make fall. Make fall. On top of the light fitting, there's a small plastic pouch. Good catch. They put them in the fingers of gloves to help hide them better. And they'll sell them to each other for uh, commissary items, candy bars, and things like that. Spurred on by the young officer's discovery, the veteran keeps sniffing around. Sure enough, he hits the jackpot. Inside a tear in one of the tent flaps, he finds a huge stash of tobacco. Fair amount of tobacco found in the tent. The been rolling. If Officer McVaugh can work out who put it there, they'll be thrown in the hole. That means 23 hour a day lockdown for 30 days. On the yard, this tobacco stash is worth more than $100. And that's a debt that can easily cost an inmate a severe beating. If Ryan Molina or his new friend Tripod are involved, they could find themselves in deep trouble with the others in the Woods Gang. Anytime you find something of this nature in a tent, you're going to start watching that tent a little closer. If an inmate is caught with, you know, it loses this amount of tobacco, unless it's their tobacco, you know, that they, they brought in, um, they, they owe somebody. They're, they're going to be nervous walking around the yard trying to figure out what's going to happen to them, or they're going to have to owe for it, if they're going to get, you know, smacked for it. You know, it's hard to tell. If I was him, I'd be very nervous. Ryan's tent will be under close scrutiny for days to come. And it's becoming clear that the fellow inmates he relies on for protection may also be the ones most likely to get him a 12-year stretch in a state prison. It's tobacco one day, shanks the next day, marijuana, um, methamphetamine. They'll just progressively get worse and worse if they see that we're not out here trying. Officer McVaugh and his men will alert the jail's intelligence unit and the special response team. They'll keep the pressure up until they find the culprits. And when they do, the dreaded SRT stands ready to strike. Meanwhile, Edward Ramirez has been on the Phoenix jail chain gang for three weeks. When we march, we march with pride. When we march, we march with pride. Stuff our boots and them up all night. The work and the conditions have been tough. But today's task will be harder than he ever imagined. Today, the chain gang is on shovel duty at a burial ground for the poor and homeless at the edge of the desert. Well, we're out here burying the indigent, uh, which means that we're here as their family. These people have no families. Or they're homeless. So we're their family today. The inmates unload the coffins from a transport van and take them to the graves. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It's grim work and another day of hard labor. And the next burial catches Ramirez off guard. The deceased is a baby abandoned by its parents. This burial is a child. 
three months old, and he was born 32307. Let us pause for a moment and pray for all children of the world. If some of you have children, remember them. Remember all those who are abused, left like this child. Pray that someday there will be an end to violence of any kind. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It kind of touched us all, having to bury a child this morning. Um, so it was pretty difficult, pretty emotional for that. I have four small children, um, ranging from 11 to 4 years old, so yeah, it hit me personally. Back at Tent City, 19-year-old Ryan Molina hasn't seen his family since he was locked up. But today he's had some good news. His mother, who had all but given up on him after his arrest, has had a change of heart. Today she's coming to visit him for the first time. I'm nervous, man. I'm nervous. I haven't seen her in a while. He knows that his only chance of being a father to his newborn son depends on convincing his family that he can be trusted and staying out of trouble. Hey. You look good. You look healthier than I've seen you in a long time. I love you. Hi, Tim. How you doing? <laughs> Better than you, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So how's um, the baby? The baby's great. I brought you lots of pictures, but you're only allowed to keep five, apparently. So you can pick the five you want to keep. These are the first pictures Ryan has seen of his two-month-old son. He's a redhead. He's a cutie. He's adorable. He's got Liz's dad's nose. Really? He's so cute. He is cute. He's almost as cute as you were. <laughs> the pictures are a vivid reminder to Ryan that he needs to change. His mother helps drive the message home. I don't know if you know this or not, Ryan, but I was doing a lot of stupid things before I got pregnant with you. I stopped doing those things because I had to take care of you. And I really pray that this is the same thing that happens for you, that you just clean up your life and you make it great for this little boy. You're going to be a great dad. And be the dad to him that your dad wasn't to you. I know. I will. Speaking of my dad, have you talked to him or anything? No. I don't even know if he knows you're here. Ryan, I love you, and I'm sorry I didn't protect you better when you were a little kid, and that you went through all the crap you went through, and that you're in this situation now. No, that's not your fault, Mom. I love you. <sighs> so I say I love her, and the rest of the family. All right? Tell the rest of the family I love them. I will. <laughs> and you need to start sending letters. I will. I love you, Mom. Give me a hug. I love you. Give me a kiss. I love you. Ryan returns to his tent, determined to serve his time quickly and get home to his son. But even if he decides to change his habits and friendships to steer clear of trouble, events are already in motion that could land him in lockdown. Working on a tip-off, two undercover officers with the jail's intelligence unit have just discovered a huge stash of tobacco hidden in a skip at the edge of Tent City. 
They think the stash belongs to two inmates in the whites-only Woods Gang. It looks like we have tobacco in this one as well. Each pouch would be equivalent to $20, $25, um, pretty much like having a Cadillac in there. For the intelligence unit, it's a significant result, one that could break the back of the Woods contraband ring. The next day, in a meeting room adjacent to the tents, the intelligence unit briefs Sergeant Irby and the special response team. They show him photos of the suspects, including the Woods. All white prisoners will be searched. Anyone caught with tobacco will be hit with 23-hour lockdown. These four individuals are bringing in contraband on the yard. I've handed my officers the individuals that we need to extract. They know that that's who they're in charge of extracting. Make sure that we get them off the yard immediately. Once they've identified and pulled the individuals that are to be extracted, officers Chavez and Death Rage will be responsible for rolling up their property. We're going to ID, pull them, strip them down to their boxers and their sandals, All right? Let's do this. Armed with 12-gauge shotguns and pepper spray, the special response team moves out to confront the group. Hit that tent. It's 3 p.m. at Arizona's Tent City Jail. Sergeant Irby and the special response team hit the first suspected tent to search for illegal tobacco. The inmates are caught off guard. The special response team pulls four suspects off the yard. Take him to the day room. And they're not finished yet. They believe there's tobacco in Ryan Molina's tent, and they're determined to find it. That first year, right there. This is the second time his tent has been targeted for a search, but it's his first encounter with the full force of an SRT raid. Get on your bunk. Ryan is forced to strip down and is extracted from the tent. Once outside, he searched for contraband. Turn on, face me. Turn your mouth. Touch your head back. Your mouth. You got problems anyway. Soon after, his new friend Tripod joins him, but he seems to be having trouble following orders. Huh? Why aren't you listening, guy? Who told me to stay like that? Who told you to stay like the that? The officer I just talked to. I don't care. Did you not hear what I said? Yes or no? No, I didn't, sir. Okay, your hands hold on right here. Unless you're told to do so by me. Do you understand me? Yes, I'm saying. You copy me? Yeah, that's. Yes, sir, by the way. Yes, sir. You're going to keep your hands on your head. You're going to stay in a single file line. You're going to the day room to sit down. All right, go ahead and go. With the tents cleared, the search continues. All Ryan can do is wait and hope that his bunk comes up clean. But his future depends on it. It is like clockwork. If you do something enough, you get good at it, and it's something that we do quite a bit out here. Sergeant Irby has been on the job long enough to know that contraband could be hidden anywhere. He and his team are prepared to search high and low. Careful. <laughs> if we come up with something that's serious, that individual could be rolled off the yard, and we have enough equipment to, to deal with him if he gets out of hand. Take that pencil and poke it and let it dump on the ground. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, it's it's granular. It's... Sugar? Yeah, looks like it. Is it yeah, it's sugar. Yeah. Sugar's the no-no here. He took away the salt and the pepper and the sugar. He took away that The stuff. sheriff took all that stuff away. After an exhaustive three-hour search, no tobacco is found. Once again, it seems Ryan and his fellow inmates have dodged a bullet. But there's one thing both the inmates and officers can count on. This raid won't be the last. They saw the force that came today to look for that contraband. And a lot of times, inmates forget that, you, that we have that many officers, if even more, that we could bring on this yard in a heartbeat. It'll calm down the yard at least for two or three weeks before they realize, OK, they're not around anymore. We'll start trying to play our games again. And then within a month, month and a half, we'll all be back out here again. Ryan Molina has survived his first SRT raid. 
If he can avoid trouble for the next 90 days, he'll leave Tent City and begin a two-month drug rehab program. I learned that you really don't have any control over what you do, and SRT and come in here, do what they want, random searches, whatever, my strategies, and just listen to the DOs, do what they say, cooperate with them, follow the rules, keep to myself, don't get in any fights, try and stay out of trouble as much as I can. I do look forward to getting out of here soon. The recent visit from his mother and pictures of his infant son have given him something to focus on. But for the next three months, each day will continue to be a tightrope walk between keeping his fellow prisoners happy and avoiding trouble with the sheriff's unforgiving officers. For Edward Ramirez, the dangers of prison life are over for now. After serving four months in jail for violating parole, it's time for his release. Ramirez, step out. The date you were arrested? December 30th, 06. There's little chance of patching things up with his estranged wife, but he's looking forward to seeing his children and making up for lost time. That door in front of you will open up automatically. When it opens up automatically, walk in, go straight across to the other door. Listen for the door, you'll hear a click. When you hear a click, push it open, head off to the left, okay? okay. He's told his entire family that he's getting out of jail this morning. He doesn't expect his wife to show up, but he hopes his parents will be waiting for him when he steps outside. There's nobody here. I miss my family a lot, and I don't know if I'm able to be able to get them back, but my kids will always be there for me, so that's it has a lot to do with me changing, making up my mind to change. It's, it's a little too late, but it's better late than never. Edward is leaving jail alone. What his future holds is unclear, but one thing is certain. In the desert, new inmates will arrive. The officers will try to keep them in line, and the battle for control and authority will continue in a place called Tent City.